Hey, this is Alex, and we have a problem. If you haven't been paying attention, rap movies are on the decline. Okay, wait, I shouldn't generalize like that. Rodent movies are unfortunately on the decline. With one of the last greats being Ratatouille, which came out all the way back in 2007. And that means I'm old. But also, we haven't gotten a good rodent movie in about 16 years. That's over half my life missing out on rodent-related content. However, this media drought got me thinking and thirsting for the perfect rodent movie, which immediately reminded of one of my favorite films growing up. It's not very traditional, but that's what makes it so much fun. Now, if you've never heard of Mouse Hunt, well, let me enlighten you. This movie was released in December 1997, uh, just like me, and most other good things, actually. It was a good year. It was directed by Gorbabinski, the same person who would go on to direct Pirate of the Caribbean, and Rango, two really good films that both starred Johnny Depp. But before his big break, he was mostly directing music videos and TV commercials. Mouse Hunt would be his first feature-length film, and it was received pretty unfavorable by critics who would shame the movie for its over-reliance on slapstick and lack of character. Which, to be fair, it's a valid point, but people at the time were blinded by its simple brilliance and were unnecessarily rude for what I consider to be a really well-made film that combined some of my favorite techniques, like animatronics and practical effects, to make an A-tier rodent movie that you probably wouldn't see nowadays. It does have some pretty obvious issues, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. The story. Mouse Hunt starts off like most kids' movies made before the 2000s, with the death of a parent. I'm sorry! Thankfully, the kids this time are grown adults. It stars Nathan Lane and Lee Evans as Lars and Ernie Smuts, respectively. Two bumbling brothers who are mostly well off. That is, until their father's sudden death sets in motion a series of unfortunate events that ultimately sees them broke and down under luck. But with nothing left to lose, they set their eyes on the dilapidated mansion which they inherited from their estranged, now dead father. While initially valued at nothing, the brothers are surprised to learn the true worth to be in the millions after it's revealed to come from a famous architect. Charles Lyle LaRue. Charles Lyle LaRue. So, hoping to sell the mansion to make a quick profit, they hastily move in and start renovations. But things aren't as they seem when the two brothers discover that their new property comes with a longtime resident, a tenacious little mouse that's unwilling to let the brothers encroach on what he sees to be his property. So, willing to do just about anything to keep his place in the mansion, the mouse makes himself known, which starts a battle of wits between the two brothers and the furry rodent. Their attempts to rid the house of the mouse leads to a series of increasingly outrageous events that ultimately end with death, destruction, and a very unexpected ending that might have you saying, uh, what the hell? <laughs> so now that you're in the loop, let's dive into what makes this ratty movie such a classic. Tim, Burton, and Jerry. Mouse Hunt is overall a mix of classic slapstick with a touch of dark comedy. It's a very physical film, reminiscent of early Tom and Jerry with its engaging visuals and pleasing Rube Goldberg as setups and payoffs. They literally did the Mouse Turf Challenge before YouTube was even a thing. So when it comes to spectacle, you're not missing out. In addition, we get some sharp and witty writing. I'm talking one mean pussy. Yeah. Okay, maybe not sharp, but definitely witty. The film is surprisingly dark in both aesthetics and its writing, which does help enhance the comedy of it all. It's cynical, but it's also satirical. Take moments like the funeral, where their father's death is played as a gag, rather than it being a somber moment, which I didn't connect the dots back then, but it always reminded me of Tim Burton movies like Beetlejuice or Corpse's Bride, where death isn't taken seriously and it's just part of both life and the joke. But it doesn't stop there, because not too long after, the city mayor chokes to death while eating at Ernie's restaurant. Which the sequence on its own is fucky enough with all the half roaches and spitting. But seeing the mayor's kids just jumping around while they carry his dead body uh, was definitely the cherry on top. It's hilariously subversive and it adds a surreal element which helps set the tone for the rest of the movie. 
Of course, things only escalate from there as more people get hurt, animals get killed, and balls are dropped. It's not very kid friendly, but to be fair, it isn't actually a kid's movie. Yeah, despite the kid friendly promise, director Gorbavinsky made it a point to say that this wasn't made for kids, which again explains the dark it takes on the usually kid friendly genre. And the rating, it's got a PG-13. Whoa, editor Alex here. I don't know where I got that PG-13 from. <laughs> I must have been high while researching, uh, which is probably true. But it's actually rated PG, which is a lot more in line with movies made before and during the early 2000s. Uh, they could get away with a lot more before they were bumped up to a PG-13. Uh, but still, I make some dumb point about growing up watching things I shouldn't have, so let's carry on. Which is shocking until you really take a step back and realize, yeah, that makes sense. Also, there aren't too many movies commonly considered for kids that are rated PG-13. But like always, some Tim Burton movies do pop to mind. Say, Edward Scissorhands and Mars Attacks, both PG-13 movies that I was watching way too young. Yeah, my mom didn't really pay attention to the MPAA, which, good, fuck the MPAA. But like anything not meant for kids, they were the top consumers, me included. You see, most animal movies at the time were targeted at kids, and the MPAA rating didn't really mean shit in 1997. So to me and the lucky bunch that grew up on Mouse Hunt and other inappropriate media, though we might now be brain dead, at least we have an exquisite taste for satire and dark comedies. So here's that. The cast. When I was a kid, one of the major selling points for any movie was its familiar faces. And look, I might not know Michael Jetter by name, but I sure as hell recognize Mr. Noodles from Elmo's World. Or that one guy who gets eaten by the Spino. I was a cultured kid. So to me, having a cast filled with actors that I would commonly see in other movies at the time made this feel extra special and relatable. Nathan Lane, who was known for being the voice of Timon in The Lion King, Hakuna Matata, what? plays a great cynical older brother as Ernie Schmutz. Spoons. Spoons. His voice is forever memorable, and I love hearing him quip, even if it's about how poor people suck. Likely and on a somewhat related note, he would go on to play Snowball in Stuart Little 2, which, you know, kind of getting back at the mice or something, I don't know, it just seemed kind of relevant. Is that a trick question? Then we got the naive younger brother, played by Lee Evans, who's probably the most sympathetic character in the film, and that's including the mouse. Ah, 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 ah. That was probably my first time seeing him in a movie, but his underdog role and his British charm made me really invested. And not just in this, but anytime he would pop up, like in The Medallion or in The Fifth Element. On the supporting side, we have faces like Vicky Lewis, who I recognize from her role in Godzilla, and Christopher Walkings, who really serves no purpose but to be weird and eat shit. Which brings me to... Mouse in baked beans. Okay, we should definitely talk about our main star. And I know, it's not really a rat, but he's courageous enough to be one. So there's that. He's never given a name or credited, which is in part due to being played by a few dozen mice, along with some great animatronics and CGI. So we're just calling him the rat. But a rat is a benevolent little bean that just doesn't give a damn. He might be the schmutz's antagonizing force, but in reality, the rat is just kind of there, an unmovable object to the brother's unstoppable force. He doesn't even become an active player until about half an hour in, where he makes his presence known by running off with an olive. And despite all the subsequent attacks, he doesn't retaliate until he becomes a life of that situation. And even then, the worst he does is set off some traps and wreck the kitchen while making a killer looking sandwich. He tossed it the side with the cheese, but not the other side. So the arugula doesn't wilt. How did he know that? Ratatouille before Ratatouille. Oh, fuck. Okay, he kind of kills a cat and mentally scars Christopher Walkins. Uh, but he's never actively trying to screw with the brothers, which they realize after Lars smashes it with an apple and they're unable to finish him off. I can't! <laughs> Showing a mutual respect for the mouse and his ability to endure. Well, they still chip him off to Cuba for a timely Fidel Castro reference, but 
there's still respect in not killing him. I'm alive! Vervinsky refers to the mouse as a monk-like figure. Um, he's more of a monk, you know, he's, he's sort of there. Which, sure, but I wouldn't go that far. Uh, he's more of a chaotic good with the added potential for a lesson learned than he is a righteous monk. I say that because our mouse ultimately undermines those benevolent observer values by becoming a corporate shill. Spoilers for the ending, but after the mansion is destroyed and the two head back to the string factory, the mouse reappears out of nowhere and literally invents string cheese for them. <laughs> they all become business partners and live happily ever after. So in the end, capitalism always wins, <laughs> really making this a true American tale. The cat. Now this wouldn't be a rat movie without a dedicated cat to go along. But after getting literally shit on by a mouse, uh, there's a lot of shit in this movie. The Smuts brothers call in for some feline reinforcement, which they get from the local pound. Who says businessman can't be activist? They bring it home and set it loose without unboxing. Not that it needed it, because our kitty cat here turns out to be a beefy boy by the name of Catzilla. And he's definitely built like it too. As a kid, I was really into Godzilla, so the name was one of the first references I understood. Which is not only a callback to the giant lizard, but also it reminded me of the Dogzilla Kids book and its sequel, Cat Kong, which I'm sure <laughs> was top reading when I was first watching this back in, uh, what, 2003? So yeah, uh, very relevant. But if you haven't noticed, our cat here is all made up. That mother back there is not real! Well, for the most part, Catzilla is a mix of what the fuck CGI, a cute black cat, and a horrifying animatronic made by the Stan Winston house. His turtle form is all CGI, which thank god for that. It's scary enough as it is. As for the real cat, they sadly only credit the cat trainer, so RIP to the cat or cats who had to wear the mouse traps as shoes. I really don't think they like that. His final and strongest form is the puppet, which was mostly used for peeping close-ups and when he hulks out of the box. It's weird and I love it. You see, I'm actually a huge sucker for janky looking cat animatronics like Salem from Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Buttercup from Dogs vs. Cats, or even that one cat from the scary movie. But I'm pretty sure this is where it started. It also helps that it's the Stan Winston studio doing the practical effects, uh, which might not be as apparent with the cat, but for our tiny mouse friend, well, he fares a lot better. Especially in scenes like the mouse escape, where scaled up miniatures are used in tandem with the cutest mouse puppet I've ever seen in my life, it's heart meltingly cute. Frankly, the movie just looks amazing, especially when it comes to its large sets and special effects. There's a lot of dynamic slapstick pieces, which I'm sure required a lot of setup and proper timing to execute. So, major props to the many departments that came together to get a dumb movie about a rat to look so interesting. Even the CGI, while not revolutionary, is nothing to scoff at. At its best, it blends the CGI with the practical, making for some really believable scenes. And at its worst, it just looks a little out of place. But for the most part, Scenes like the cherry drop or the cockroach bit hold up to today's standard, which is not something you could say about every movie made in the 90s. Christopher Buscemi. Okay, so after our mouse straight up marks Catzilla, we're treated to Christopher Watkins as a critter expert. And it's a very fitting role, especially for the 90s since he seemed to be in just about everything from that weird scientist in Spy Kids 2 to a dingy sidekick in Desperado. Wait, what do you mean that's not Christopher Walkings? That's, that's Steve Buscemi? <laughs> that's a little recreation of what actually happened years and years back. But for the longest time, I didn't know they were two different people. So to me, he was literally in most of the movies I was watching. They both have very peculiar features, and both did a lot of movies with Adam Sandler. So it all blended together in my dumb little head. But Walken's role in this was short, and he doesn't really do much but eat shit, twice, and die. 
like Catzilla, he mostly served as another hurdle for our mouse and a stepping stone to our finale. Rich get rich. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the significance of class status in a movie about a mouse. So let me do that right now. There's a lot of moments that focus on the upper class and how carelessly they throw money around like it's worth nothing but also value wealth more than anything. What are you saying? I love how even the mouse falls to the lords of capitalism in the end. Though he didn't have much of a choice with his home also being destroyed. So if anything, he was a victim of circumstances, which makes this even funnier. <laughs> in the end, he sells out and the rich prevail. Sucks to all the string workers who got fired, but hey, that's business and that's top tier reading too much into it. Fine cheese. Now, like every good cheese, there has to be a stink to make it good. And Mouse Hunt stink really comes down to two things. Uh, Patrice women, and the ending. So if they're not an evil cheating spouse, then they're just a floozy that lets you grope them. There's a point where April, Lars' wife, kicks him out for not selling his father's company, uh, just to later get horny and take him back in, only to then finally leave him when the mansion goes bust. And then the German sisters, who could have been a good foil to our Ernie and Lars characters, are just used as over-sexualized gags. So, yeah, not the best representation. Also, there's a lot of shit in this, like literal feces, which three out of the four times were eaten by somebody. And I don't know if I find it funny or gross, so I'm just putting it out there for the world to know. Raisins. And on the less controversial side, but more stinky side, we have our last act, which I would often skip because of its pure unmitigated chaos. See, I would only put on Mouse Hunt before bed, so seeing everything fall apart would literally stress me the hell out. <laughs> but I guess that's the whole point of a finale, to have a bombastic finish. Ten million! Ten million dollars. Mouse taketh and the mouse giveth. Ultimately, Mouse Hunt is one of those forgotten gems that feels more relevant now than when it came out. Okay, maybe relevant isn't the right word, but it feels like the humor was made for a more cynical time. Which is exactly the type of time we're in. Where humor used to be more earnest and played straight, it's now a lot more dark and satirical. Nothing is meant to be taken seriously, which is something the movie captures with its satirical take on the rich versus poor, all done through a cat versus mouse metaphor. So watching this now makes me appreciate how ahead of the curve it was, even if it was unintentional. Alright, thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far. Let me know what your favorite rodent movie was growing up. Bonus points if it was Stuart Little too. Uh, that was that was a blast. And of course, don't forget to leave a like for a poor rat like myself. I'll try to touch on some more rodent movies if this does any good. So engage if you like it. But with that, stay poochy, and I'll catch you on the next one. Come on, you little rat. Yeah, you heard me.